In this video, we will exploit a vulnerable Grafana application hidden inside a subdomain. The exploit involves a dangerous DuckDB extension which allows executing arbitrary shell commands. Inside the box, we will uncover another hidden application that runs regular commands as root. At the end of the video, we will analyze which part of the Grafana code is vulnerable and understand why we don't see other processes as regular user. Let's fire up RustScan. Let's add some extra arguments for nmap so it will return more information and it will save our scan output to a file. I'll pause the video and come back once it is finished. Scanning is complete and we only have two open ports, SSH and HTTP. The web port didn't have too much information, so let's go straight to the browser and explore it. This is a website that offers courses. There is a form here with different selections, but they don't point to anything interesting, so we won't be able to get much from this. Let's scroll down and see other parts of the site. Looks like a normal static page. We see here more details about the courses offered as well as the various names. Going just right below it, we see the same names and it turned out that they are the instructors. Names are interesting as we can leverage this for password spraying attacks or any kind of credential reuse later. At the bottom, there are more links, but they also don't point to anything interesting. Going back to the top, let's see if the search button is linked to any kind of script. We don't see anything here. Typically, if this is linked to a server-side script, we will see something like a PHP page referenced here. So let's ignore this and look for other vectors. How about the course details? It point us to another page. If we inspect the button, it is linked to a PHP script, so we might be able to find something here. Let's put some dummy details and click Submit. Okay, registration successful. If it prints our username or email address, that means it might be using a templating engine in the back end and we can perform server-side template injection attacks. But it didn't so we can drop SSTI from our list. How about if we try to put some unsupported entries? We cannot do it because there is a built-in feature in HTML forms that only allows valid email address. We can also see that from the HTML code, which uses email input type. So let's use a proxy to handle this. On our last videos, we have tried Burp Suite, MITM Proxy, and Zap Proxy. In this video, let's try another different proxy tool, which is Kaido. This is very similar with Burp, but with unique functionalities. First, we need to start our local instance so our browser will be able to connect to it. Once it is started, we can close this main window and we can continue logging in as guest. Let's move this to another workspace to maximize our view. Then we create a new project. Let's name this HTB Planning. After that, we need to watch out for the intercepted request under HTTP history page. Let's go back to our browser and trigger a valid request. Then in Kaido, we see it here. The first thing you might notice is the visuals. You see that different parts of the HTTP request are color-coded. Aside from that, we see the usual functionalities like converting the response into different formats. One unique feature of Kaido compared to other proxy tools is that it has its own query language. This means we can search different requests efficiently, which is really useful when there is a large amount of traffic on our view. For example, we can look for requests that contains a particular host header. Those are just some of the useful things with Kaido, so let's get back to our main topic, which is to fuzz the request parameters. Let's send this to replay. We want to send a valid request first so that we will see the normal response, so I will just hit send. The content length of a valid response is 7,128, so let's take note of this. Now, let's try putting some special characters in the email parameter, which we were not able to do a while ago due to HTML validation. I always start with single quote since it typically breaks any SQL queries in the backend. Let's hit send. I don't think it did anything unusual since the content length is still the same. Now let's do the same thing for the phone number. Same thing, nothing happened. Lastly, let's try the full name parameter. Nothing as well. Sometimes we can also try to change the request type from post to get, but I don't see an easy way to do it in Kaido similar with Burp. So let's just manually edit the request. Then put the parameters on the URL. And let's also remove this content type. Let's hit send. We don't see a response. Oh, there is a nice reminder from Kaido that we forgot to add line terminators. Even though we don't have a request body, it is still mandatory to put terminators as defined in by the HTTP protocol. So let's add new lines. This time we get a response, but it is not interesting as well because it looks like it just brought us back to the main page. That means the server side logic doesn't accept get parameters. What we can do next is to try to fuzz it by injecting different special characters on each parameter just to make sure we catch most possible scenario. We can do that in Kaido by sending the request to automate function. Then from here, we pick sequential. 
and we mark the place where we want to inject the payload. In this case, let's start on the phone parameter. After that, we need a list of special characters. We can use this file from SecList. We copy the content and paste it on the Kaido payload list. So it will try all items here on the injection point we define. Let's hit run to start the fuzzing. Based from the result, all content links and status code are the same, which means it is unlikely that this parameter is vulnerable. If we see something like error 500, that is a good indication that we broke something and might be vulnerable to SQL injection. I think the last thing we can do is to fuzz all parameters. So let's mark the other two places as injection point. Then we hit run again. We see here that it tries to inject the payload across the different places. But unfortunately, we still haven't get an interesting response. So let's stop fuzzing and look for other attack vectors. Let's go back on the main page and look for clues. It says here, first choice for online education anywhere. And it also says you can study from the comfort of your home. This means the website is providing an online service. Typically, services like this have different subdomains. For example, some may look like this or probably something similar to learning. So what we can do now is try to fuzz for subdomains that may be hidden. We can also use fuff to do that. There is a nice word list from SecList containing the common service names. We can use this as a starter. Then we target the IP address of the machine and pass the host header. We will look for subdomains, so we will put the keyword in this location. After we trigger this, we will receive a lot of false positives, so we need to filter. Let's filter by the amount of words and run again. The word list is small and we already got a hit. We expect to see something related to online learning, but instead we got Grafana, which is a monitoring visualization for systems. But it's okay, at least we have something interesting. So let's access this subdomain. Typical attacks against Grafana requires credentials. The beauty with this box is they already provided the admin password. We just need to find a valid exploit. As you see at the bottom part, the Grafana version is exposed. So let's find an exploit for Grafana 11.0. There is this GitHub page that came up, so let's explore it. It allows remote code execution and arbitrary file read, but we need to see if our target is vulnerable to this. Scrolling down, we see that we are indeed vulnerable, which is perfect. The exploit author also put some information about the vulnerability, which we can explore later. For now, let's clone this on our attacker machine. Then we want to create a Python virtual environment so it will not clutter the modules installed on our operating system. After that is done, we will install the exploit requirements. Then let's determine on how to use the exploit. We need to pass the username password in the command we want to run. To test this, let's check the user ID of the current user. It worked and we are root. Does that mean we already pawned the box? It is also possible that the application is running inside a container, which is typical in DevOps environments. We can quickly verify if we are indeed inside a container by looking for this file under the root file system. It is present, so yeah, we are running inside the container. It will be hard to continuously enumerate by running the exploit multiple times, so let's trigger a reverse shell. Containers are one of the hardest to enumerate because most of the binaries are not present. So let's find the tools we can use. First, let's see if there is a netcat binary present. It looks like it doesn't have it. Just for testing, let's try to look for a valid binary so we can compare the responses. It is there so meaning the netcat binary is really missing inside the container. The next binary we can look for is Perl. It is present. So let's go to revshells.com and find a payload using Perl. The format is complicated, so we are risking breaking our payload. A nice workaround is to convert this into base64. Then let's copy that and decode it inside the container. After decoding, we need to pass it to bash to execute it. Then we got now our callback. We just need to stabilize our shell. Enumerating inside the container is slightly different from normal virtual machines. First is, we want to get as much information about application running because normally the Docker image contains secrets and credentials. Let's go inside conf directory. And let's try to grep for passwords. There are too many information here, so let's exclude the default and example files. Nothing interesting. Let's see inside Grafana if there are users other than admin. If there is, then we may be able to extract the password from the database and do password spraying. It's only admin here, 
It is also possible that there were old users that got removed, so let's find some backup database files. Nothing came up. One last thing is we can inspect the current environment variables of the user. This is a common place to put configuration settings and secrets. We can clearly see here that there is a username and password. We don't know the purpose of this, but we can use it for password spraying. There is an SSH service running on the box, so let's try to log in as Enzo. It worked, and we were able to break out from the container. Let's quickly check if Enzo has any pseudo permissions. He doesn't have, so we need to find other privilege escalation vector. Let's check if there are other users in the box. There is only root and Enzo. Let's see if there are other home directories. Nothing aside from Enzo. How about other processes running inside? We only see ourselves, which might be because the mount options of slash proc is preventing us. How about files with SUID bit? These files are standard binaries which are not exploitable. Next thing we want to enumerate is to look for applications installed. Let's go to slash opt. This is unusual. Cron tabs are usually located inside varspool, but we have one here and it is world readable. There is a command that saves the Docker container. We also see the zip password being used. A while ago, we were thinking that there might be old Grafana database backups that contains old users. So this might be it. At the end of the command, it removes the backup file. But let's see if there are still some backups present on disk. Since there is nothing there, we can look across the entire disk. Nothing also, we only have a Python module, which is not interesting. Since we cannot see if there are other processes running, what we can do is to look for listening ports. Typically, this is not hidden from the users. The first should be the Grafana container, but the next is suspicious. Let's try to access it. No output. Let's add verbose option. It says we are unauthorized and it is running a Node.js application. In order to enumerate this further, we need to access this via a browser. So let's do port forwarding. Let's upload Chisel to the target. Then we will run Chisel server inside our attacker machine. Back to the target, we will run the Chisel client. This will connect to our Chisel server on port 8181. And inside our attacker machine, we will be able to connect to the service via port 2222. You can use any port, but I usually go with that one. Let's go to our browser and access it. Okay, so there is a basic authentication which is same on what we saw from the curl output. Since we already gathered several credentials throughout our enumeration, we can brute force this using Hydra. We pass the user and password list. Then we target the forwarded port via 2222 on our local. Since this is basic auth, we use the HTTP get option. And finally, we pass slash as the target endpoint. We got a hit, so let's try this. Oh, so this is a cron tab application, which is the one that backups the Grafana container. This is most likely running as root, so let's try creating an entry. Let's put a command that will add an SUID bit on bin bash. If this is successful, we must see an SUID bit in this part of the permission. Let's run it. Then let's go back to verify. It worked, meaning we can now drop to root shell. Our effective ID is now zero and we can perform privilege actions. Before we end this video, let's analyze the exploit and understand why we were not able to see other processes in the box. The author put a nice diff command here to see the exact vulnerability. The patch removed the duck function, which allows authenticated users to execute SQL expressions. The expression is injected inside a JSON payload, but this is for reading a file. We are curious how remote code execution worked. So let's go open the script. We have here a function called run query. That should accept the SQL expression provided by the attacker. Then the vulnerable endpoint is this one. We have a function to read a file. Below that is the one used for executing commands. Executing shell commands inside the database is normally not permitted. So in this scenario, it installed an extension called shell FS. Let's have a quick look on what is this extension. It allows shell command for input and output. This is really a dangerous extension if not used properly. Going to the GitHub page, we see here the format on how to do that. We just pass any shell command we want and terminate it with pipe. So this is the reason why the patch removed the use of this extension entirely.
Another thing we encountered during our enumeration is that we were not able to see other processes inside the box. As I mentioned a while ago, this is because slash proc might be mounted with hide PID option. It says here invisible. Let's do a quick Google search about this option. Based from AI overview, the default value is zero, which means regular users can see all processes inside the box, even the ones owned by root. Next option is one, which means hide all processes except our own. Last option is two, which means everything is hidden, which might also include some of our processes. The value of hide PID inside the box is set to hidden, so I guess that is the same as option two. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.